ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host for this evening, Mr. Clive James. to Wembley Stadium and let's hear it from the biggest studio audience in television history 100,000 people <laughs> and all over the world hundreds of millions of people at home are joining us to see out the old year sing in the new and find out who wins the award for the man or woman of the year in 1990 so from everybody here, let's hear it again for everybody out there. <laughs> yes, Wembley Stadium is the only venue big enough for the night when we look back through 12 turbulent months. Back to the night when, 12 months ago, we look forward to tonight. I've looked forward to tonight. <laughs> And when we look back on it, I hope we look back on a night to remember. A <laughs> night when we remembered. On the first day of the new year, it was soon apparent to the world's most acute political brains that 1989 was over. Good God, this is 19... 1990. <laughs> and President Bush was right. But the real leader of the free world was Margaret Thatcher. Expanding her range, she did a cameo role in Coronation Street, brilliantly playing a mad woman gripped by the delusion that she had the love of the common people. What a lovely surprise. You're going to charge him with this little stick on the floor. On the international scene, Moscow was the setting for the final showdown between the world's two great economic systems, communism and McDonald's. At McDonald's Red Square branch, Soviet citizens got their first chance to order fast food that arrived on the same day. The factory workers, who had never eaten anything except asbestos, were now exposed to their first Big Mac cheeseburger with double fries and a stiff shake. McDonald's was the biggest thing to hit Moscow since Brezhnev's wife. But Lithuania, denied a hamburger franchise, was seething with rebellion. Gorbachev flew in to calm the situation. <laughs> Still helping Gorby to make Glasnost a reality, George Bush, celebrating his first anniversary as U.S. President, saw off his new ambassador to Moscow with warnings to watch out for pickpockets. There's no point keeping your wallet up here, said the president, because you won't feel it go when they lift it. <laughs> Put your keys in it so that it feels heavy and keep it down here near your ding -ling. <laughs> Later in the month, a disaster struck large areas of the country. Inadequately trained sky television engineers <laughs> Installing dish aerials without following the proper procedure <laughs> drove screws directly into the gas mains and deprived thousands of citizens of their chance to see Keith Chegwin. <laughs> the government immediately found a scapegoat. Mr. Norman Fowler, Minister <laughs> for Major Disasters, resigned, coining the phrase that he wanted to spend more time with his family. Mr. Fowler then presented the press with a photo opportunity. He was shown spending more time with his family. <laughs> the photo opportunity went on for half an hour before Mr. Fowler realized that the woman he thought was his wife was actually a Labour Party canvasser <laughs> and the children belonged to the family next door. <laughs> Symbolizing the power of the soon-to-be united Germany, onto the world scene strode the gigantic Chancellor Kohl a man whose far-seeing vision was aided by the fact that his eyes were 10 feet off the ground. <laughs> In Czechoslovakia, playwright President Václav Havel stayed cool for a state visit from Chancellor Kohl. After all, if there's anything the Czechs are used to, it's the sudden arrival of a powerful Mercedes with motorcycle escort <laughs> and a face-to-face -face interview with a very large, overbearing German. <laughs> Television history was made when American pop group New Kids on the Block were flown in to star in a BBC Two late-night philosophy seminar on the meaning of life. 
I got Tigger the Tiger on my tour bus. You know, Winnie the Pooh. I don't know if you have that over there. Oh, yeah. The cartoon, Winnie the Pooh. There's a tiger on it called Tigger the Tiger. And I have him, I sleep with him on the bus. Winnie the Pooh was actually invented over here. But you couldn't expect the new kids to know that. They were so busy composing and performing masterpieces like Hangin' Tough. It was a contrapuntal tour de force in which the new kids successfully pretended to be a gang of half-wits complaining about the clothes they had bought in the CNA autumn sale. February began with the Channel Tunnel in trouble. The money ran out, and unless more could be found, the water would run in. <laughs> Mrs. Thatcher saved the project by showing how everyone could do a little bit of tunnel drilling from home. <laughs> with disaster staved off, Mrs. Thatcher made a crucial move to keep the Channel Tunnel vision boring forward. Next day, Mrs. Thatcher revealed the identity of the buffer, her loyal Deputy Prime Minister, Sir Geoffrey Howe. <laughs> It was still months until the World Cup, but in Italy, they already had a secret weapon. The singing goalkeeper, Luciano Pavarotti. The only goalie in the world who could save 20 shots at once while singing the beautiful aria, Maradona e Mobile. <laughs> Britain's export drive to Japan was booming. All they had sent us was cars, TV sets, stereo equipment and other trivia. We sent them something more durable, the Rolling Stones. <laughs> The Japanese respect history, and the Stones were certainly that. With a combined age of 2,000 years, they were older than the Japanese Imperial House, but Mick wowed the audience with his mastery of the Japanese language. Watashi tachi wa nihon ni kuru no nagaru matshimashita. In South Africa, the government inflicted the final punishment on Nelson Mandela. They released him to rejoin his wife, Winnie. <laughs> For Mandela, all the exciting attractions of freedom lay ahead, but no prospect was more exciting than the invitation to fly to London later in the year and meet the exciting Neil Kinnock. I want to assure you that I'm absolutely excited. <laughs> But Neil Kinnock's main concern was the prospect of a reunited Germany. Saying there was nothing to worry about, he summed the whole situation up in one snappy sentence. I think one of the ways to throw back any nationalistic feeling is to ensure that there's a calm and constitutional process beginning with a form of economic unification and then going through the rigors of constitutional change in the years following that. I think that's <laughs> We have to leave Mr. Kinnock's sentence there, but we'll come back to hear him finish it either later in the program or early next year. <laughs> of all Mrs. Thatcher's triumphs, none was more dazzling than the poll tax, a fair system under which everyone suffered equally. <laughs> the poor from excessive taxation and the rich from excessive laughter. <laughs> Mrs. Thatcher put a low figure on the average householder's annual contribution. Four billion pounds. <laughs> Royalty and sport were both big in February. The Princess of Wales visited the British Formation Synchronised Swimming Team. <laughs> Back from their triumphant fifth place in the Commonwealth Games, the team were rehearsing for their new TV show, Come Swimming. <laughs> BBC Television launched a smash hit drama serial called Sense of Guilt, the story of a young woman racked by a guilty secret. While her husband was away at work, and without his knowledge, she had both Sky and BSB aerials installed. <laughs> Inevitably, he found out. Why didn't you tell me? I couldn't. I, I don't know. I felt silly. It would have spoiled everything. <laughs> this? This isn't spoiling everything? I know. I'm sure. I just... I just... I can't... I... I... Those viewers who had seen satellite television identified with the torment of these distraught young people. 
much. And even Mrs. Thatcher's admirers were worried that there were few old faces left in the cabinet except hers. But the PM herself liked the way that her current cabinet all said yes simultaneously at the mirror's wave of the cat and nine tails. I have found no nervousness in cabinet at all. I think we have the most united uh, and cooperative cabinet I think that I've ever had during my whole time. <laughs> Chancellor Cole of West Germany made an historic journey eastwards as guest of honor at the first East German Convention of Chronic Dandruff Sufferers. <laughs> das erste Ostdeutsche Chronic Dandruffschmerzen der Verein. As dandruff flew in the harsh eastern wind, Herr Cole promised that relief was on the way. <laughs> <laughs> Britain's Foreign Secretary Douglas Hurd was a master of languages. With German, for example, he was able to translate even the most difficult concept into idiomatic English. Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mrs. Thatcher was now going from strength to strength. Her brilliant idea to grant the people a poll tax was making her more popular than ever. In London's Trafalgar Square, overjoyed people came together in a spontaneous upsurge of rapture. In celebration, traditional English games were played. Catch a policeman races. There was a point to point. And there was late night shopping in the warm light of burning Volvos. Mrs. Thatcher met any slight criticism of the poll tax with a reasoned argument which convinced everyone by its searching analysis of the fundamental points at issue. Poppycock. <laughs> Interest rates were sky high. Mortgages were out of sight. People were worried. But they had their minds put at rest when the Chancellor of the Exchequer, ex-hod-carrying son of a trapeze artist John Major, <laughs> responded to questions about his plans for the country's financial future. I, at this moment, have not given that a moment's thought. <laughs> this month's cabinet resignation was Mr. Peter Walker, who, like Mr. Fowler before him, resigned to spend more time with his family. <laughs> Mr. Walker was some way into this photo session before he realized he was spending the time with Mr. Fowler's family. <laughs> Mr. Walker's own family had failed to recognize him, and was still waiting at the station. <laughs> the new star among European leaders was undoubtedly President Havel of Czechoslovakia. Mr. Havel won friends everywhere, maintaining his cheerfulness despite suffering from the understandable restriction of a pair of old socialist underpants. <laughs> The world was beginning to hear of President Saddam Hussein of Iraq, a Middle Eastern leader who made you long for the friendly warmth of the Ayatollah Khomeini. <laughs> but Saddam had the technical know-how to bring his country forward into the 14th century. <laughs> At the annual session of his one-party parliament, he announced that he had personally invented the bath plug. <laughs> you stick this in the hole in the bath, he said, and the water stops there instead of running out and making the sand sticky. <laughs> Yes, I thought you'd like that, he told his fascinated audience. Wait till those cocky Western bastards hear about this. <laughs> British Miners Union leader Arthur Scargill was asked by everyone, including the few remaining British miners, what had happened to the money which had been sent from all over the world so the miners' strike could be prolonged well past the point of disaster. <laughs> Finally, the truth began to emerge. Scargill, it was said, had blown the money on a 20-foot Russian garden gnome <laughs> to decorate the grounds of his secret luxury miner's cottage, Dunstriken. <laughs> For the British Labour Party, power came that much closer when Glenda Jackson was selected as prospective MP for Hampstead. Mr. Neil Kinnock, in a false beard, personally delivered the news. <laughs> Mr. 
This is the Lord's doing. <laughs> it is marvelous in our eyes. <laughs> Madonna was the Margaret Thatcher of the pop world. She went on and on and you really didn't want to listen. But Madonna had figured this out and thrown in a few hand movements. She called it voguing. Soon everyone was doing it. Douglas Hurd, master of languages and an international Thatcherite, now demonstrated that he was fully at home in French. Nous n'avons pas à vous reprocher d'éprouver le besoin d'une vision lumineuse de l'avenir. Unfortunately, Mr. Hurd was in Germany at the time. <laughs> Down in Iraq, Saddam Hussein, philosopher, philanthropist and revolutionary bath plug designer, <laughs> proved that his interest in plumbing was no flash in the pan. Saddam had personally invented a new sewage system for Iraq that came out in Kuwait. <laughs> Saddam then went on television to tell the waiting Iraqi millions that plumbing was even more difficult than it looked. The apprentice plumber, he said, must be careful not to catch his thumb. <laughs> it is very easy to catch the thumb between the spigot and the flange. <laughs> if you do, he concluded, you might get angry and do something stupid such as starting World War III. <laughs> the Middle Eastern beauty contest Miss Tea Towel 1990 was won by exotic PLO lovely Yasmin Arafat. <laughs> Yasmin's prize was a tour of the Vatican and a chance to meet the Pope with whom she exchanged gifts. Always generous with her favors, Yasmin presented the Pope with a framed photograph of the Tripoli Girls High School netball team, <laughs> of which she had been captain when it attacked Israel in 1973. <laughs> Moved, His Holiness gave Yasmin a shaving kit from the Alitalia business class handout pack. <laughs> and now, it's time for our first quiz question. One of these men has a remote chance of becoming Prime Minister of Great Britain, and the other was born in Wales. <laughs> Which is which? American billionaire Donald Trump's booming career now reached another zenith. He was the man who had everything. Owner of one of the tallest wives in New York, he had rebuilt her several times and installed luxury entertainment areas on the mezzanine and the 40th floor. <laughs> Property experts were asking how could he top that? He topped it by acquiring a controlling interest in Marla Maples, a modern structure with low running costs, considerable potential for redevelopment, and a constant cool air supply from the vacant top story. <laughs> but Marla Maples proved to the world that although she loved Donald with a deathless passion, her feelings towards Ivana were without malice. I think she's an absolutely beautiful woman. I think she was before surgery. <laughs> On 
On the British political scene, something extraordinary had happened. Labour were ahead in the polls. Mr. Kinnock's colleagues knew the party could stay in the lead as long as they stopped him giving a speech. <laughs> but he jumped out of the armoured car. <laughs> and after removing the straitjacket and the gag, he headed for Westminster on foot. Before he even got there, Labour were behind again. <laughs> The world of sport was rocked to its Reebok when one of its superstars announced his retirement. He was snooker genius Alex Hurricane Higgins. Higgins bowed out with a speech that showed he had learned what that fatal eighth pint before breakfast can do to a man. <laughs> and had drunk the ninth to get over it. So I would like to announce my retirement from professional sport. But I'm not to so very well because this game is the most corrupt game in the world. As Alex was carried away to the waiting skip, sports fans were disconsolate. Those of us who knew him will remember him for the qualities that made him such a successful leader of men and such a good friend. <laughs> As the weather got warmer, the annual marching season began. Britain's Rottweiler owners marched to protest against the declining supply of small children. <laughs> For obscure Italian classical composer Antonio Vivaldi, April was a big month. He finally broke through when British musician Nigel Kennedy not only recorded the Four Seasons, but also analyze the piece with stunning intellectual precision. The second movement I see as a kind of warning of the nuclear explosion, the first bad one, what's going to happen, and it's a bit kind of represents mushrooms and stuff, and like, maybe, you know, mushrooms as taken as inspirational substances also. I mean, it could be, it's all of that stuff in one, kind of premature, like, picture of the um, nuclear bomb exploding, and like, also kind of a little bit, you know, hazy and messed about in the head. <laughs> Even as he spoke, the British public had stormed the record stores to drown out the sound of Nigel talking by listening to the sound of Nigel playing. In May, American Vice President Dan Quayle arrived in Britain to visit Mrs. Thatcher at her country residence, Chequers. At Chequers, Mrs. Thatcher pointed out to him some subtle aspects of British rural life. This is a house, she explained. <laughs> that thing over there is a tree. <laughs> Who's that guy up the tree, asked Mr. Quayle. <laughs> That's my husband, Dennis, said Mrs. Thatcher. Despite Mrs. Thatcher's invincibility, Michael Heseltine still cherished dreams of the leadership. At his vast secret training camp, he personally built a replica of Number 10 Downing Street's front door so he could practice going in and out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, in the Soviet Union, Gorbachev's dynamism had caught the imagination of the world. Britain's own Princess Anne was looking for a new man in her life, and there could be only one choice. Despite the difference in their backgrounds, the attraction was immediate when, in front of the world's press, they met secretly in Moscow. <laughs> it's always nice to meet another horse lover, he told her. He himself had been eating it all his life. <laughs> Princess Anne was then presented with the Soviet horse biscuit made out of pig iron. <laughs> On top of that, from the state ceremonial plastic bag, was produced a KGB Jack Boots number no. seven makeup compact <laughs> containing two spare hair pieces <laughs> donated to the Soviet people by British hero of labor, Arthur Scargill. <laughs> the Green Party was now a force in British politics. It drew lots of media attention at its annual conference. <laughs> Prince Charles turned up incognito. <laughs> Yeah.
Germany and suspicions that Chancellor Kohl was an unfeeling, globally ambitious technocrat were set at rest by the discovery that he had a secret girlfriend, a humble secretary called Alice von Schneckenheim von der Heilbrunner Hildebrand Pfaffenpfeffer. <laughs> when Kohl visited Washington, President Bush said he had heard the Chancellor had a lady friend called Alice von Schneckenheim von der Heilbrunner Hildebrand Pfaffenpfeffer, but the President said the world would like to know what the Chancellor called Miss Alice von Schneckenheim von der Heilbrunner Hildebrand Pfaffenpfeffer for short. Alice. <laughs> Romance was in the air for Nelson Mandela, who had taken up with the haunting Palestinian beauty Yasmin Arafat. <laughs> they made a lovely couple. <laughs> Luciano Pavarotti, the Italian singing goalkeeper, was invited to visit Moscow. In Red Square, he showed the Russian press how he planned to keep goal for Italy in the forthcoming World Cup. <laughs> that night, he sang for the Gorbachevs at the Bolshoi. Raisa, as usual, was lost in the pages of her Harrods catalogue. <laughs> but then the performance began. Luciano sang an aria from the famous Russian opera Boris Yeltsin. The aria was the hauntingly lovely Your Tiny Potato is Frozen. <laughs> was a triumph and Luciano was showered with Russia's highest floral tributes consisting of many varieties of flowering potato <laughs> including the very rare Siberian spud orchid. <laughs> As Archbishop of Canterbury Dr. Runcie's retirement grew closer the Archbishop warned applicants for his job about the difficulties it entailed. These included wearing a very silly hat, which tended to lose its jewels even in a moderate wind, <laughs> wearing the traditional sanctified duvet cover in similar <laughs> condition, and of course, being followed about by two very weird old men with sticks. <laughs> June. And the Gorbachevs were in America, which is where most Russians would go if they had the money. <laughs> they were welcomed by President of Mrs. Bush, who joined them in a competitive square dance. <laughs> the Gorbachev astonished everyone by achieving a remarkable do -si do to the right, with a promise of a free market economy within six months. The climax to the festivities was the traditional East-West Summit game of Pass the Pen, in which the loser is the one who ends up with the Russian pen <laughs> and the ink stain on his inside pocket. <laughs> the Gorbachevs then moved to London, where Raisa checked in at Harrods, while Gorbachev kept a secret tryst with Mrs. Thatcher. The reasons why he had spurned Princess Anne now became apparent. Gorby and Margaret were crazy about each other. Unfortunately, their precious moment was ruined by some unknown man who kept interrupting to tell boring stories about his sleepless nights. I don't sleep at night, and I have to sleep in the afternoon. I have an inkling to sleep in the afternoon. Should I tell her how from that award in a snow chip? Yesterday, I almost uh, fell asleep after watching the tweet. Uh, <laughs> there were big changes at the cutting edge of British show business. Andrew Lloyd Webber left his wife, and Prince Edward left Andrew Lloyd Webber. <laughs> Which brings us to our next quiz question. One of these men has immense legal resources, which would make it inadvisable for me to suggest that he is anything less than a genius. The other makes tea. Which <laughs> is which? <laughs> the British Commonwealth celebrated the much-loved Queen Mother's 90th birthday. She would have preferred a quiet morning on the telephone to her bookie, but her family had other plans. Pretending they were taking her to Ladbrokes, Princess Margaret <laughs> and Prince Charles kidnapped her and took her to a special ceremony of celebration. <laughs> Representatives from every branch of the Commonwealth were ready to march, sail and fly past in salutation. Look, she said, here come the whole New Zealand army. And there they were, <laughs> the whole New Zealand army. And there were the crack troops of the SAS. <laughs> And here's Eddie's bunch, said the Queen Mother. And there they were, Prince Edward's own long-range pantomime unit. 
train to perform behind the lines until the enemy surrenders. <laughs> the brave men and women of the Royal Daimler Retrieval Unit. <laughs> the first and second bearers of the Queen Mother's Bran Flakes. <laughs> she loved them all. The eyes of the world were on Rome for the finals of the World Cup. The voice of singing goalkeeper Luciano Pavarotti became a symbol of the tournament. Luciano should have kept goal for Italy against Argentina, but unfortunately he had a prior engagement to give a concert. His disappointment was given lyrical expression. <laughs> were bound to win because they had a secret weapon, a man called Gaza who had revolutionized English football by actually running towards the opposing team's goal <laughs> with the clear intention of putting the ball in it. Gaza's match-winning potential was disturbing for England manager Bobby Robson. Robson had been instructed by the Foreign Office to ensure that West Germany won the tournament so as to further European unification. <laughs> the only team who could thwart Britain's master plan of losing to Germany was Argentina. But Argentina's goal-scoring potential was cut in half when it was discovered that Maradona had an injured hand. <laughs> So, West Germany conquered the world yet again, but the abiding memory of the World Cup remains the tearful face of the great Gaza, after it was explained to him that 40% of his endorsement fees would be liable to tax at the higher rate. <laughs> July, and even before reunification, Germany was already looming large as the biggest power in the new Europe and perhaps the world. Meanwhile, Britain slept. There was only one man who foresaw the Teutonic menace. His name was Nicholas Ridley. <laughs> Superficially, Ridley was just another obscure Tory who hoped to be mistaken for a gentleman farmer if he raked a few leaves about at the weekend. <laughs> then he came to realize that German paratroops had been landing during the night <laughs> and concealing themselves in his garden with great skill. <laughs> but Mr. Ridley, a trained observer, knew they were there somewhere. <laughs> After finding a complete panzer division in his rhododendron, <laughs> Ridley went to see Mrs. Thatcher and outlined his secret scheme to have every British garden tested at dawn for the presence of sauerkraut. Mrs. Thatcher listened patiently, nodded, and hit him with a poker. <laughs> Ridley was unbowed, and as he left 10 Downing Street, he saw evidence that more German paratroops had landed while his back was turned. <laughs> Look, he said, there's one over there behind the dustbin. To alert the nation, Ridley had no choice but to resign and spend more time with his family. <laughs> In fact, German attention was, as ever, turned not towards Britain, but towards Russia. Chancellor Kohl went to the Soviet Union, where he had some business interests. President Gorbachev hoped to sell some of his country's high-tech products to Germany, including the new streamlined Russian family car, which, <laughs> on a single tank of one-star petrol-free lead, could travel the whole length of the queue waiting to buy it. <laughs> Corby and Cole had had a few beers by now, and so they went for a pee in the river. <laughs> a neat sulfuric acid outlet from the People's Synthetic Biscuit Factory. <laughs> then Gorby displayed the latest designs of the People's Postmodernist Furniture Factory, <laughs> including this dining room suite, which could be easily added to by supplying your grandmother with a tree trunk and an axe. <laughs> 
But a triumphant visit nearly ended in disaster. It took a long search of the parking field to find the missing keys to Chancellor Cole's Series 11 BMW with the reinforced passenger seat and the illuminated map of the world. <laughs> Show business, and after trouble with money and with his back against the wall, one of the country's best-loved old-time music hall comedians staged a triumphant return to the limelight with the show that he himself entitled... It's Get Arthur Scargill Time. Arthur Scargill, National Union of Mine Workers, popular figure with the media. But all coming to our assistance now, liberal leaders, bishops, we've got the work. <laughs> Just a little pledge and say, for once in my life, I'm going to tell the truth. Just try it. Scargill, tell me, did you receive money from other trade unions? I said, yes. He said, and how did you get this money? I said, in cash. He said, in cash? I says, yes. He says, why? I says, I thought it was legal tender. <laughs> Nelson Mandela arrived in London to consult with his Savile Row tailors and, incidentally, to meet Mrs. Thatcher. Mrs. Thatcher admired his cashmere overcoat with the hand-stitched buttonholes. She told him Dennis used to have a coat like that, but he left it behind in some pub. <laughs> Mr. Mandela and Mrs. Thatcher had an hour-long meeting, and it is believed that the word Mr. Mandela tried to get in edgeways was but. <laughs> Mr. Mandela then left, saying that solitary confinement was underrated. <laughs> The new Archbishop of Canterbury was nominated. He was someone called George Carey. Nobody knew who George was, but at least he wore the right clothes. And George sure knew how to get through a church door when it was stuck. <laughs> In France, it was 200 years since the revolution, and sheep had still not been given the vote. But now... A flock of angry sheep, led by the fiery revolutionary sheep, Francois Mouton, <laughs> stormed the Eiffel Tower. They were ruthlessly repressed by the French police and eventually returned quietly to their pastures of origin to spend the rest of their lives as sweaters, twin sets, and Sunday joints. <laughs> Such was the parlous state of pop music that human beings couldn't cope with it anymore. Turtles took over. From the balcony of New York's Radio City Music Hall, the Turtles belted out a collection of banalities which went straight to the underdeveloped brain stems of turtle fans and other pond life all over the world. <laughs> August was the hottest month in British history, and Mrs. Thatcher had become the world's most sultry woman. President George Bush was merely the latest man to fall passionately in love with her. Mrs. Thatcher and Mr. Bush kept a secret tryst in Colorado. But the media found them, and they had to emerge from the undergrowth, trying their best <laughs> to look innocent. When reporters asked Mrs. Thatcher if this was a long-term relationship or just a one-night stand, they found her in a mellow mood. Don't worry, you'll hear later. <laughs> Meanwhile, back in London, Dennis Thatcher was beyond consolation. He wandered the lonely streets, searching for his old local. <laughs> but he couldn't find it. He was lonely, he was thirsty, he was a man without a pub. <laughs> back in the Gulf, Saddam Hussein was finding that power is an aphrodisiac. Out of the shimmering desert swayed the girl of his dreams. She was haunting Palestinian <laughs> beauty, Yasmin Arafat. And there was no mistaking the barely pent-up passion of their mutual embrace. King Hussein of Jordan was in a difficult position. 
he was not only squeezed between the fundamentalist irrationalism of Saddam and the potential politico-economic hegemony of the West, he was also very short. <laughs> King Hussein went to see Saddam and found that Saddam was six inches taller than he was. <laughs> King Hussein went to see President Bush and found that President Bush was nine inches taller than he was. <laughs> King Hussein went to see Mrs. Thatcher and found that Mrs. Thatcher was only three inches taller than he was, but 20 decibels louder. <laughs> King Hussein returned to Jordan and went to bed for a week. <laughs> Back in Britain, the Gulf crisis had started to bite. Foreign Secretary Douglas Hurd graphically demonstrated that due to a shortage of oil, his hair was out of control. <laughs> Arthur Scargill, for all his difficulties with the media, the law, and the art of hairdressing, was still the darling of the trade union movement, and at the TUC conference, he and TUC secretary Norman Willis fraternally buried their differences. When I was making those comments, at the back of me, the general secretary, I could hear shouting rubbish. Well, he should know. Well, it's true. Well, you should know. It's interesting, for example... For us betrayers, total because we disagree support. with you. First I've got Maxwell, then I've got uh, uh, the second uh, uh, sumo wrestler. Uh, uh. <laughs> Afterwards, they warmly shook each other's throats. <laughs> with many a cry on Willis' side of, what did you do with the money? And from Scargill, the bantering answer, shut up, you fat fool. <laughs> the Liberal Democratic Party held its first annual conference at Blackpool. Excitement mounted to fever pitch when the party unveiled its new vote-winning features. First, it did not include David Owen now rumoured to be trainee manager of the tooting branch of Spud You Like. <laughs> Second, it had a brand new logo, the dazzling seven-winged flying worm. <laughs> it was bound to win the votes of all those interested in seven-winged flying worms. <laughs> Australian tycoon Rupert Murdoch told his English secretary to organise a world tennis tournament in Rome. Misunderstanding her boss's Australian accent, the secretary organized a world tennis tournament. <laughs> On the worldwide repeat showing in September, the tennis final became the most successful sports program in television history. Instead of a couple of boring Swedes hitting topspin lobs at each other's endorsements, there were three macho Latin tenors singing Rome into ruins. It was a battle of the giants, but finally only one man could take the title. Italy's singing goalkeeper, Luciano Pavarotti, became the Grand Slam tennis champion of 1990. King Hussein of Jordan was once again making a tour of world leaders but this time he had made a big leap forward in the art of diplomacy, overcoming his height problem by the expedient of sitting down. <laughs> the king still had the problem of how to leave a room without getting out of his chair, but he had come a long way on short legs. <laughs> Mrs. Thatcher had more energy and sex appeal than ever. Her emotional interest in the world's most prominent men verged on the flagrant. What did she remember, she was asked, about a recent trip to America? a most skillful handling by the president. <laughs> Dennis Thatcher was disconsolate yet again. He flew to Paris for the weekend and checked in anonymously to a small hotel on the left bank. But the wine waiters of Paris <laughs> soon heard that he was in town. <laughs> At the Labour Party conference at Blackpool, Neil Kinnock was in terrific form, but as he and his wife entered the conference hall, Glenys was showing signs of strain. <laughs> <laughs> Following criticism that he was too verbose, Mr Kinnock was greeted with a storm of applause when he promised solemnly never again to say anything three times. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for that marvellous, marvellous, marvellous reception. <laughs> As the Labour Party folded its khaki army surplus tents in Blackpool, the Tories were erecting their pink and white striped marquees in Bournemouth. Mrs. Thatcher was a goddess. At the gala ball, she graciously materialised amongst her worshippers. 
Dennis was a bit high that night, but she had him on a tight leash. <laughs> The conference, the conference was a triumph for Mrs. Thatcher and a final defeat for Mr. Michael Heseltine's futile but long-cherished ambition to challenge her leadership. In a brilliant move by Mrs. Thatcher's personal staff, Mr. Heseltine had been given the wrong address for the conference. <laughs> so instead of going to Bournemouth, he went to Borneo, where on the esplanade in front of the exclusive Holiday Inn Tarakan, he gradually realized there were very few conservatives present. <laughs> A broken man, he contemplated a new career in men's personal cosmetics. <laughs> Mrs. Thatcher was now a truly exalted leader. So exalted that Mr. Kenneth Baker had no other function except to demand acknowledgement of her divinity. Hands up, hands up, all those who believe that the Prime Minister is doing a good job. <laughs> Lester Piggott made a sensational return to horse racing and gave an interview afterward to Romanian television. The Romanian interviewer spoke English, but Piggott stunned even his admirers by answering in fluent Romanian. You know, he came and beat me, and then, you know, I nearly got back to him. And, uh, you know, it was very close. Soviet President Gorbachev arrived in Paris to meet French President Mitterrand and sign a treaty guaranteeing the supply of French onion rings for Soviet hamburgers. <laughs> President Mitterrand had heard of Gorby's skill in snaffling the best pen on these occasions <laughs> and preempted him by putting his Mont Blanc away before his guest could get his hands on it. <laughs> but Gorby tricked him by saying, you have pocketed my worthless Soviet pen by mistake, Mont Blanc. <laughs> Mitterrand fell for it. In the Gulf crisis, little did Saddam know that Britain's secret weapon was about to be launched in his direction. <laughs> yes, the whole country had realized that Edward Heath was the ideal man to send on a hopeless mission into the world's most dangerous area. The mail has been enormous. And they've all said, thank God you're going. <laughs> In Britain, the Liberal Democrats were on the move again. They won a sensational by-election in Eastbourne. Which leads us to another quiz question. Both these men are Liberal Democrats. Can you name a third? <laughs> Barbara Bush invited the Princess of Wales to Washington because she was worried that the poor girl was wasting away. You should eat, Barbara told Diana. Get some meat on those bones. Your clothes are just hanging on you. Come inside and have some nice quail pie. <laughs> Sir Geoffrey Howe was now the last remaining member of Margaret Thatcher's original cabinet, having survived so long chiefly because Mrs. Thatcher hung her coat and handbag on him when she arrived at <laughs> cabinet meeting. But beneath Sir Geoffrey's mild exterior lay a savage beast, ready to spring into action with the coiled reflexes of some great jungle cat. <laughs> Matters came to a head on the flight back from an EEC conference in Rome, which Sir Geoffrey and Mrs. Thatcher had attended together. When she told him to step outside for a newspaper at 30,000 feet, Powell's <laughs> reaction was immediate. <laughs> Mrs. Thatcher was in trouble. Suddenly, Michael Heseltine was looking like a leader. <laughs> Mr. Heseltine's campaign for the leadership was based on how tall he was. To enhance his height advantage, he flew to Jordan to be photographed with King Hussein, <laughs> beside whom Mr. Heseltine could normally expect to look very tall indeed. But King Hussein had learned his lesson about standing up and had been sitting down since midway through August. <laughs> He remained seated throughout Mr. Heseltine's three-week visit. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the absence of Mr. Heseltine, Mr. Hurd was the tallest candidate. His appearance on Come Dancing with six-foot-tall volleyball champion Samantha Hayhoe Silva <laughs> made a big impression on Tory women MPs. But finally, as Mrs. Thatcher had known all along, nothing could stop ex-hod-carrying son of a trapeze artist, John Major. <laughs> Yes, the man who had started out as a hog-carrying son of a trapeze artist 
was now the youngest hard-carrying son of a trapeze artist ever to become Prime Minister. That evening, the normally quiet Mr. Major permitted himself one crazy night of celebration. In his favorite restaurant, <laughs> Les Amis de Pommes Frites, he recklessly ordered a double portion of poached eggs with extra HP sauce. <laughs> with her young protege safely installed in number 10, Mrs. Thatcher drove to the palace where she gently broke the shattering news that she wouldn't be popping in on Tuesdays to give the Queen her instructions anymore. <laughs> November was the month when Sinead O'Connor's song Nothing Compares to You was voted Song of the Year. It was a song of loss, a cry in the night, the broken body of a seagull on the beach, the weeping of a child for its missing marbles. We could only add to its pathos. It's been said The election of the hugely charismatic Mr. Major as the new Prime Minister came as no surprise to other world leaders. President Bush was immediately on the phone to President Gorbachev. You won't believe this. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bush, worried about failing to recognize Mr. Major if he met him, cleverly decided to greet every stranger he met as Mr. Major. Hey, how are you? <laughs> There was yet another technological breakthrough in Japan. The new Sony photo booth was personally tested by the emperor. The first set of prints didn't turn out, so the emperor reread the instructions carefully. <laughs> then the emperor put the empress into the booth. Those prints didn't come out either, so he read the instructions again. The empress returned disappointed to the imperial palace. 
and the Imperial Minister of Photography received a certain amount of criticism. <laughs> Gorbachev went to Rome to meet the Pope and make the first confession any Soviet leader had ever made outside KGB headquarters. <laughs> Gorby was ashamed that in the swap the pen contest, nobody ever wanted to end up with the Russian pen. <laughs> the Pope told him, that is because your pens are unfillable. Try one of mine, they're infallible. <laughs> Tina Turner and Rod Stewart, whose careers went back to the days of Lana Turner and Stuart Granger, blocked hair moose and reminded everyone how good this kind of music can be if you know what you're doing. The dynamic pair raved on until Rod's trust became entangled in Tina's surgical tights. was almost over. Christmas was coming and it was the season of goodwill when all over the world people come to call on each other to reinforce old friendships. An elderly American arrived at number 10 Downing Street with the cheery words, boy, tell Mrs. Thatcher I'm here. <laughs> the French and the British met under the channel. To symbolize the glittering future for trade, a French flag made in Toulouse was exchanged for a British flag made in Toulouse. <laughs> for Mrs. Thatcher, the question of what lay beyond being Her Majesty's First Minister could only have one answer. In the new year, she herself would be crowned queen. As the old year ended, her chief task was to rehearse for the ceremony. By dead of night, with only a few hundred ex-cabinet ministers present, she practiced for the great day with the aid of her consort, now Sir Dennis Thatcher, Baronet, Knight Grand Corkscrew of the Order of the Saint Again. <laughs> As for the current queen, Her Majesty was looking forward to abdication because it would give her more time to spend with her family. <laughs> Before Big Ben chimes 12, there should be just time to find out who wins the title of our man or woman of the year. Yes, it's time to present our coveted award for the man or woman who has made 1990 perhaps the most memorable year since 1989. Before that, however, some only slightly lesser prize winners. The bronze bra for a brass broad award goes to Madonna. The woman who has proved that you don't have to be Arnold Schwarzenegger to make men afraid when you take your clothes off. <laughs> Sadly, Madonna can't be with us tonight because she's fighting Mike Tyson. <laughs> the Polly Peck Prize for successful management goes to Bobby Robson. The man who proved that given the facilities, the faith and some talented lads, England can still come forth. <laughs> Sadly, Bobby can't be with us tonight. He's on Belgian television saying the lad's done brilliant to lose by so little. <laughs> the Edwina Curry Award for Unashamed Femininity goes to Yasmin Arafat. <laughs> the woman whose merest glance could send a camel through the eye of a needle. <laughs> Sadly, Yasmin can't be with us tonight. She's still in airport security in Athens. <laughs> so, with time running out and the world waiting to hear who has won the title man or woman of the year, it's time to open the envelope and reveal that the man or woman of the year is the man of the year, and the man of the year is... Sadly, I have to stop there because it's midnight, but I'll be back to announce the man of the year after Big Ben strikes the hour.
it's time to announce the man of the year. And the man of the year is the man who sings on earth the way God does in the shower, Luciano Pavarotti. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, sadly, Luciano can't be with us tonight. Fly by me, Good heavens, it's Luciano Pavarotti. Behind you, here. Luciano. <laughs> Happy New Year, Luciano. Thank you, and to all of you, Happy New Year. Luciano, congratulations on a great year for you and for Italian opera. And I suppose if you'd beaten Argentina, it would have been a great year for Italian football. But we beat England. <laughs> Luciano, allow me to present you with the Man of the Year trophy. Thank you very, very much. I'm very touched. I received many of these trophies, but this is one who is going to stay very, very close to my heart for a long, long time, forever, I hope. Luciano, it's a lot to ask, but you've introduced millions of people to the most beautiful music in the world. I wonder if I could ask you to sing Nessun Dorma for us just one more time. Okay, help me with this, and I will. Thank you very much. Grazie. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the man of the year from 1990, Luciano Pavarotti. That was just wonderful. Was it good? Ah, oh, fantastic. Yeah. Incredible. I mean, yeah. it was really wonderful. Thank Luciano, you. now, can I persuade you to lead us as we sing Old Lang Syne? What's mean? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a Scottish saying that means 
Old Lang Syne. <laughs> but Luciano, to do Old Lang Syne properly, we can't do without the pipers and drummers of the Scots Guards. Good. with the pipers and drummers of the Scots Guards, the assistance of Luciano Pavarotti, and above all, with the participation of yourselves, everyone in the stadium and everyone at home. Let's sing the new year in. Are you ready? Yeah. 